Being uh, blog viewers, I'm going to cycle back to the virtue of love, and of course, love um, is is a um, critical virtue. It's um, in some ways thought of as sort of a typically thought of as a relationship with a second self. Um, uh, when we, you know, are in a loving relationship, um, an extended relationship of that sort, um, the only person in the world that is essentially experiencing the same reality that we are is, of course, the person that we are in love with. And that person is uh, essentially um, experiencing, there are, of course, some differences, but, but still um, these two people are basically discussing everything. They are um, seeing almost the same things. They're living in a certain place, certain community together. Um, they are attending many of the same events, um, have many of the same sort of <clears throat> desires and goals for the future. So the second self-concept is important to keep in mind with love, that there's a second person there that's sort of on the same fundamental path that you are, and there's sort of an extended relationship with that person over time. Um, and love is, of course, this, this journey uh, with this second self uh, can be thought of as the most fundamental level, this, this progression from um, a, a point in time A to a point in time B um, with this other self. And uh, uh, the critical point is to think about how this journey can go smoothly and um, proceed um, in the way that's best for both people. Um, now, of course, to say that, um, of course, love in any relationship in general um, is only as good as the sort of original foundation of, of the relationship. And it's only as good as uh, A, the original foundation, and B, um, whatever continues to maintain that foundation. Um, for example, in the case of two friends, the friendship would only be as good as what originally created the friendship and then what over time uh, both friends have done to maintain the friendship, what sort of foundational anchor or cement or whatever sort of image you want to use, what is that sort of basis that is, 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 um, is, um, is holding these two people together. Um, and if the foundations are good, uh, if, uh, it would seem like the friendship would last uh, longer or forever, and if the foundations are bad, then it would seem like it would not last very long. Um, and so um, we have to think about certain things that um, certain foundations are better than others, I would think. And so certain things like money or power or certain perks, um, certain sort of uh, pleasurable activities one, one enjoys in for a period of time, these things, none of these things again are bad, but they're unlikely to hold two people together, it would seem, for very long. Uh, money comes and goes, power comes and goes, the pleasures of youth come and go. Um, and so these friendships, and I think Aristotle pointed this out probably earlier than anyone, um, these friendships just cannot last very long because the foundation is, is not something that's going to last. Um, <clears throat> I think love is sort of similar in that sense, um, love being a form of friendship. Um, doesn't mean if the foundations are good, it would seem like, and they're continued, and they're if they're good initially and they're maintained over time well, then it seems like the lovers will have nothing but a wonderful life. Um, of course, you know there'll be disagreements and there'll be um, issues that come up, but those will be resolved. Um, but if the foundations were sort of unstable to begin with, then it wouldn't make sense. Uh, it would be a miracle, one would say, if the relationship survived. And it can happen, but uh, it would be sort of going against the trend for something like that to happen. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, uh, I guess sort of from the perspective um, uh, uh, of, of these kinds of relationships, um, it's important to know that, uh, or to think about it this way, that, that these things can be very good for quite a while, um, uh, even if the foundations are bad, uh, if the foundations are changing unstable. Uh, they can be good for many years even, um, but uh, at some point they won't endure. Uh, and maybe that's not such a bad thing. Maybe it's not so terrible for two people to be together when things are good and, and just to sort of uh, go different ways when, um, when they've become fundamentally different people, when the foundations are just not compatible. Uh, it's, it would seem that it would be better at that point for, for two people to find other people where their foundations are more in line. 
Um, <clears throat> so, but from the perspective of of good, which we're talking about, the perspective of human good that we've been sort of anchored anchoring the blog on, trying to find out what good is, what is good for man. Um, yeah, man, of course, always being understood as man or human. Um, and from the perspective of human good, however, I think it's best to say, or I think it's best to think of the project of finding someone that uh, that you can love as an extended self over the course of a life uh, lifetime. There is certain advantages here um, uh, if if there is actually love in the relationship. If there's not, then none of these comments apply. But if there's love, and and uh, the relationship is tethered to strong things then it would seem to be a wonderful thing from the perspective of human good to find someone like this and, and do whatever is required to keep it keep that relationship um, stable. And uh, some of the advantages would be sort of obviously a stability uh, over the course of a life with someone. Um, and no sort of one would avoid the sort of depression and agony that can that can haunt people for years when a relationship goes sour. Um, one can um, uh, sort of the person that one is with for very long for long periods of time comes over time to know you better than anyone else so there's that knowledge and say again going back to the second self concept it's someone that can sort of um, uh, help you and give you um, sort of the feedback that no one else can give you the ideas about yourself and and and, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, where you're going and how you're doing with things that no one else would sort of know so we see beyond, see behind some of your motivations for things. Um, you know, if you're interested in, in for example, becoming a certain, uh, uh, going into a certain occupation for the wrong reasons, maybe your, maybe your beloved would see that quicker than others. Maybe you'd come to realize that yourself at some point. But, but the advantage would be if you're with someone that really knows you, cares about you, and um, has put in the time to really figure out who you are, then you would get that. Uh, perspective much earlier. So from all those perspectives, I think it's, it's and it's just a beautiful thing I would say, uh, to see, you know, two people uh, enduring life together, going through the ups and downs, um, aging, um, and uh, dealing with things as they come for, for many years together. That is a, just from the perspective of beauty, I think it has a certain form of beauty. Um, and again, all this assumes there's actually love in this kind of relationship. Both people find each other beautiful. Um, of course, again, there there could be some conflicts, um, likely to be conflicts when two people care about things. There are millions of issues come up in the course of relationships. Uh, you know, where to eat, from the trivial to the very serious, where to live, where to uh, uh, where to send kids to school, where to um, how hard to work. Uh, all these issues have to be balanced. Where to go on go for trips. Um, of course there's going to be some conflict disagreements, but if, but uh, these things would get resolved um, appropriately and without one person sort of dominating the other person uh, with a sort of compromise, compromises reached but not surrenders from either person. Um, and so with those sort of preliminary comments, I want to look at Stendhal's book, again, Love. Um, this is the uh, Peng Penguin Classics edition translated by Gilbert and Suzanne Sale. Um, and um, uh, Stendhal, in love, um, he talks frequently about what is <clears throat> what is sort of the best, best things to anchor a romantic relationship on. What are the best uh, uh, sort of um, uh, personality traits in another person? Uh, and what are personality traits or, or things we shouldn't base love on? And some of these are familiar, but some of these are a little bit, Sandal sort of uh, says them in a different way, in sort of different perspective. Um, and, um, and and so his point, though, but his, his central concern, I think, in love is to discuss sort of what is it that makes for a grand passion? What is it that makes for sort of grand love that sort of is, is likely to be enduring uh, a while? Uh, not only enduring, but while it's enduring and while it's stable over many years, it's still animated by sort of a real passion, a real um, sort of love of, uh, of both people. Um, and of course we saw um, in the Phaedrus, I think we saw there was a mention in Plato in, in the Platonic dialogue, the Phaedrus, where 
um, one of the speakers says, you know, if there's if there's a relate, if there's a, a love, there's there's the pure and the impure, and the impure version, I think, uh, in the Phaedrus was a, a love where two people are simply just cohabiting together, not out of love, but out of sense of sort of contractual duty of marriage or whatever, some other sort of obligation that people are sort of living together, not because they're in love, but because they don't have a better alternative or because they can't see a better alternative. And I think Stendhal has a similar viewpoint on that, on love. He doesn't regard the relationship as being infused with love when people simply are living together. Um, love is, for him, I think, a relationship with his second self or one doesn't hold anything back. Um, I'm going to quote from page 162 here, where uh, <clears throat> Stendhal writes uh, here, uh, here, and he's talking about... Um, <clears throat> talking about Florence and the city of Florence. Here being in love is not as it is in Paris, seeing one's mistress a quarter of an hour in a week and the rest of the time stealing an occasional glance or a squeeze of the hand. The lover, the fortunate lover, passes three, passes four or five hours of every day with the woman he loves. He talks to her of his lawsuits, his English garden, his hunting parties, his career, and so on. This is an intimacy of the most complete and tender kind. He addresses her in the second person singular, in the presence of her husband, and indeed everywhere. So um, here we have again a, a relationship where not you know 15 minutes a day, not holding back uh, details of one's life, but really uh, a love where two people sort of infuse or suffuse um, basically everything that happens to them uh, together. And, and so for that kind of love and that kind of relationship. Uh, Stendhal, uh, uh, I think, in, in love, gives many, many observations on what, what is it, what personality traits in two people, or what is it that can, uh, what, what, it, what um, virtue, or what, what, um, what would allow two people to be in that kind of love together and, and, and maintain that, and what, what is that, and I think he, Stendhal gives uh, sort of an interesting answer. Um, and he says, of all, I think he says, above all other things, uh, what we should really look for in a partner that, that uh, if we want this kind of love, is, is a sort of authenticity, is a sort of a genuineness, a sort of a creativity, a creative spirit that sort of is forward moving and is, is, uh, is uh, to the deepest core themselves. Um, they, they've cultivated their unique self and. Um, uh, the person is not in any way, shape, or form uh, putting on airs. Uh, this person is, is sort of looked within to the deepest sort of fiber of, of moral personality or moral being, moral spirit, and, and located, whatever it is. Uh, not necessarily sort of a philosophic spirit or, or an artistic spirit or an intellectual spirit, but found something truly their own, sort of taken off all the vestiges of, of the self that are not truly... Uh, one's own and located at core and and, and and this person is comfortable enough to not be ashamed of that and not put on airs and, and is, is a personality that is um, uh, has, once it's located that core is, is, um, is, is fully content to express it and, and for Stendhal that was the basis I think for him as we will see in a number of the passages when two people sort of are uh, have located that sort of authenticity in their personality and are expressing it, that is the kind of relationship that I think he thinks is, is going to be stable. And we get indications of that sort of throughout love. He said he writes at one one forty five that um, that uh, a man sees a French woman French woman with their little graces, quite charming and seductive, for the first three days, but boring on the fourth that fatal day when he discovers that all these graces, carefully studied beforehand and patiently rehearsed, are eternally the same for every occasion and for every person. So again, this person is not, uh, he's talking about these French women, uh, they can be sort of uh, interesting, delightful at first, but then one sees that, you know, it's sort of, sort of a show that's been put on for every person, every occasion, and it's ever repetitive. Um, and so that was for him... Um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of one sort of non-authentic personality, um, and then he says, 
He sees uh, German women, on the other hand, so natural and so enthusiastically carried away by their imaginations, but frequently having nothing to offer for all their unaffectedness except ser sterility, insipidity, and cloying sentimentality. So again, while this person, while the German women he's talking about are a little bit more natural, a um, little less putting on airs, but still they're not sort of, there's no creativity in them, there's no sort of um, this driving sort of personality to them, there's no spirit that's sort of pushing forward. And so, um, so that was, that was uh, another um, uh, sort of uh, uh, personality trait that uh, Stendhal did not think was compatible with this kind of love. Um, on 147, he writes, um, uh, let's see here, he says, um, he says that uh, uh, despite liberty which has only lately been driven out of their island and despite the admirable originality of the national character, these girls, and he's talking about English girls, these girls lack originality and interesting ideas. They are often remarkable only for the quaintness of their <clears throat> delicacy. It is all very simple. The modesty of women in England is the pride of their husbands. But however submissive a person may be, her company soon grows burdensome. Hence the fact that men find it necessary to get gloomily drunk every evening instead of passing the time with their mistresses as in Italy. In England, the rich, bored with their homes and on the plea of necessary exercise, walk four or five leagues every day as though man were created and placed on earth for the purpose of trotting. So in a relationship here, again, where one person is not sort of creative, not original, doesn't have sort of interesting ideas, uh, men are sort of driven to walking into the countryside for no reason. Uh, they get drunk every night and they do basically everything to avoid being with, uh, with their beloved. Um, on 152 he writes, um, the, beset, the besetting sin of English society which daily gives rise to more unhappiness than does debt and its consequences uh, may be exemplified by something I was told this autumn in Croydon in front of the fine statue of the bishop. No man here wants to press forward in case he should be disappointed in the attempt. So again, it's a personality that is sort of stuck and not moving forward. Um, he writes here, love in the United States. He's talking about love in the United States. And he writes, um, a free government is one which does its citizens no harm, but rather gives them security and tranquility. But this is a far cry from happiness, which is something man must make for himself. For his would be a coarse spirit who regarded himself as perfectly happy simply because he enjoyed serenity and security and tranquility. Um, so again, happiness here, he says, happiness has to come from within, something that some each person has to make for himself through sort of, I think, again, Stendhal would say that sort of authentic spirit, uh, a sort of a, a spirit that sort of is, is enraptured with sort of tranquility and security um, uh, would not sort of find the need to locate that authentic sort of person, personal dimension uh, within their character. Um, on 243 he writes, um, and I think this is probably the best example of of Stendhal's um, uh, locating sort of a lack of authenticity for a lack of love. And he writes here on 243, In a fine castle near Paris, I have just met a handsome, witty, wealthy young man of less than 20. He chanced to be left almost alone there for a long time with an extremely beautiful girl of 18, talented, remarkably intelligent, and also very rich. Who would not have expected a passion to ensue? ensue? Nothing of the sort. Both these pretty creatures were so eaten up with affectation that they were concerned only with themselves and with the effect they would ought to produce upon each other. Um, I think that's really hardly needs any more description there. Um, he writes again, and page later he writes, the young people of this period will be at their best at 40, for they will have, uh, uh, for they will have lost their mistrust and pretentiousness and will have acquired gaiety and ease of manner. So there, sort of an authenticity that um, sort of casts aside all sorts of pretension and all sorts of um, uh, sort of airs uh, will finally acquire sort of a uh, sort of gay, uh, easy of manner spirit that sort of is the sort of foundation, I think, for sort of uh, the love that uh, Stendhal talks about. <clears throat> now, in love, um, not only does Stendhal sort of talk about what, what should be um, the basis of these sort of uh, relationships, but he also talks about what things that one should avoid. And um, I think some of these things we've seen before 
uh, but it's sort of a consistency with some of the other writers. Of course, reason, uh, sort of uh, w uh, two things, or uh, two things he sort of um, said that we shouldn't base sort of our, our choices on these regards would be sort of any sort of um, uh, sort of rationalistic view of who we should love, or sort of any sort of sort of prudential look of uh, prudential uh, view of who we should love that's sort of driven excessively by uh, the considerations of money or power or stature or um, all, again and with human reason again things that uh, picking out people that we think could you know from the standpoint of reason would sort of make a good match um, uh, on paper I guess you could you could sort of phrase it in that sense and you can see that on 164 where he writes um, and he's talking again about love in the United States. Um, he writes, uh, all their attention in America, he says, all their attention seems to be concentrated on a sensible arrangement of the business of living and on foreseeing all mishaps. When at last they reach the point of harvesting the fruit of so much care and orderly planning, they find they have no life with which to enjoy. Uh, and then right before that he writes, we see that the Americans, without the misfortunes created by governments, feel themselves to be lacking in something. It is as though the springs of sensitiveness, sensi sensitivi sensitiveness have dried up in these people. They are just, they are rational, but they are not at all happy. Um, so their sort of sensitivity and passion is contrasted to sort of a, a prudential, rational view of life where one is sort of planning exactly, you know, where, uh, what's sort of the best way to sort of live a comfortable life and sort of uh, avoid all sort of mishaps along the road. Uh, those things, again, for, for Stendhal seem to crush sort of sensitivity and passion, which were the, sort of the, the building blocks of love. Um, <clears throat> Again, it sort of gives a similar view on, um, <clears throat> I think, to uh, 219. He writes, nothing is so interesting as passion. Everything about it is so unexpected, and its agent is also its victim. Nothing could be duller than mannered love, where everything is calculated as in all the prosaic affairs of everyday life. So again, love, the tension between love and sort of the prosaic, sort of the dull, uh, calculating, pragmatic reason that we need to get through the, day-to-day -day living. Fundamentally, Stendhal thought those kind of viewpoints, those sort of mental perspectives were at odds. You could, you could certainly pursue one, but um, he thought, I think, that it would be in conflict with the other uh, sort of view of life. Um, <clears throat> he says on uh, 229, um, again, money should not be the basis uh, of any sort of grand love. He says here at 229, Goethe or any other German genius values money at its true worth. One must think of nothing but making money until one has an income of 6,000 francs a year, and after that, think of it no further. The fool, for his part, does not understand the advantage of feeling and thinking like Goethe. All his life he thinks and feels only in terms of money. It is by this process of double franchise that the prosaic in society seem to carry the day against those of noble heart. So as we've seen, I think, in Plato and, and Aristotle and several of the other thinkers you looked at, money, of course, has a certain role, a certain a certain place to play in a good life uh, in terms of satisfying certain needs, but it's usually far, far lower than what we think it is. Um, uh, okay. Sendal's quote on Goethe here is saying 6,000 francs a year. We should sort of try think of nothing but sort of securing the kind of money we need to take care of our basic needs first, but beyond that point, we should think of everything but more and more money. And so that, that is a viewpoint we've considered and certainly had um, much uh, much agreement with in, in, in the various posts. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that is sort of uh, what I uh, found to be the most useful uh, points on love out of uh, uh, sort of the second half of Stendhal's love. I think we, we blogged on it in the first... Uh, uh, first half of the book and earlier part of last year. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I want to sort of end the post by thinking about what, what Stendhal gets right here about love and what he gets wrong, I think. Um, and I think he gets right the idea that love should not be anchored, obviously, on things like money or, or any sort of, sort of excessively prudent calculation. Excessively. Of course, we should, to some extent, think about uh, not totally abandoned prudence or reason, I think, in choosing a beloved. But um, 
but sort of any sort of excessively prudent calculation of the benefits one, one expects from a beloved or one expects from a relationship, that sort of calculation is probably not the right path to sort of any sort of a grand love. Um, I think Stendhal is right to say that the focusing on those kinds of things, sort of comfort and money and, and sort of what seems rational in terms of the relationship. Uh, those, these kinds of things typically do kill the imagination, as he says at some point, uh, from any sort of great longings. And I think that sort of does kill um, uh, the creative pursuit of love. Uh, I think he's also right to suggest that these kind of uh, relationships that are sort of not based on sort of grand passion can have a sort of stability and sort of contentment and security, but without being infused with any sort of serious passion. I think he's he's psychologically, I think he's made the right observation there um, that, uh, that uh, it, just because a relationship doesn't have this sort of grand passion doesn't mean it can't have its own sort of contentment and uh, sort of um, uh, security to it. But again, he didn't he wanted us to sort of contrast it with with uh, with passionate love. Now, for some people, that might be uh, that's all they're interested in or they're all they want. And uh, and so I think there's not again, it's with all these other things, there's not one conception of love that should be uh, forced on everybody. I think it's more a matter of as with all the virtues, um, locating fundamentally different alternatives uh, to the proper or to the exercise of the virtue and, and determining what what makes um, the best sense for our particular situation. Someone that's sort of had a certain lifestyle may, um, uh, it's, uh, may very much be uh, uh, interested in, in just a stable, content love that doesn't have any sort of grand passion, but someone else in sort of a different uh, upbringing or a different life path may, may be very much be craving that. So I think it's not right to um, insist on one, one, one model for everybody. Um, <clears throat> now I think um, Stendhal's praise of authenticity is also uh, well taken. Uh, any sort of presentation, <clears throat> any sort of presentation of a self that is not really one's own can't last very long. A self that we are most of the time our sort of dominant characteristics and personality will over time just express itself. You can't even help, can't help but being expressed. Uh, sort of our facial expressions or sort of our sort of habits, uh, our sort of tone when we say things, these things will all be expressed. So there's really no reason to hide it uh, from someone else. There's no reason to dress it up, uh, sort of dress up ourselves in a way that we think will be acceptable to whoever it is that we are pursuing. Um, and I think there is the virtue, I think um, uh, in this sense, uh, not only is love a virtue, but in love, authenticity is, is a wonderful virtue uh, for promoting love. And um, I think um, uh, surely if love is a relationship with a second self, one would want to be with a self that one knows is actually truly itself, not some sort of other self that will change constantly over time, um, and is a self that is creative and driving forward and sort of uh, has developed an inner life and spirit that is truly their own uh, and is sort of comfortable in their own skin. I think those are all virtues that are promotive of sort of the grand love that, that Stendhal praises. <clears throat> now I think the painful question a difficult question that Stendhal avoids and ducks, or at least I didn't really see it in the text, is what is one to do if um, one falls in love with someone that is sort of authentic and creative and sort of has a real self and is uh, has all the characteristics that Stendhal praises um, and, and, and one experiences that sort of grand passion. But then later we discover some sort of destructive personality trait in the other person, some sort of real failing of character. Um, what are we to do there? Uh, what are we to do? A Stendhal sort of goes silent. Um, of course, since we're in love, we're often blind to these traits, or we sort of, I think, more often we're not quite blind. We see them, but we don't really want to deal with it. Or we just kind of hope it'll resolve. We hope the positive attributes the person make up for this thing. Sometimes they do, and sometimes sometimes things do go away. And so this, those aren't entirely foolish um, uh, strategies. But um, but what if what if it doesn't go away? And what if it stays? And what if you're still um, in love? 
And that that seems to be really the the, the difficult question that a lot of people find themselves in. Uh, passion has taken its course. People are obviously deeply in love, but they fundamentally see some really serious um, personality flaws uh, in people. Some really really difficult um, things that just make the ordinary functioning of the relationship next to impossible. What is what are you to do? And I think um, I, I think um, this might be sort of one price that that someone committed to uh, this sort of love that Stendhal praises, sort of passionate love. I think this might be maybe the price of that sort of relationship, that sort of love that we you have to sort of deal with it. Nothing on earth is perfect. Uh, neither is sort of passionate love. It has its it's obviously has its failings. Um, and so you may have to endure some very destructive uh, tendencies in another person in exchange for the sort of the grand love that Stendhal praises. Um, this could be in certain situations, depending on the person, depending on the situation. could be an acceptable trade-off. But I think at some point, uh, I still think at some point, some destructive tendencies become just too serious to ignore um, if they're not corrected. Uh, they become too destructive, and uh, we should walk away from them, um, even as one continues to feel that sort of passionate love. Uh, I think Aristotle said it best when he said that uh, man is under no fundamental duty to love um, evil uh, in another person. And, uh, and I think there are demarcation points in love as there are demarcation points in all the virtues, in all judgments in life. Uh, uh, I think it's tough to discern with precision where those lines are, but I think over time, and I think with the um, the advice of people other than ourselves, uh, the advice of friends and, and family and people like that, we can discern these lines easier. And uh, I think uh, even though it's hard to figure out these points at some point, despite still the presence of that passion and love, <clears throat> we do have to draw a line in the sand, move on, and sort of face the music, so to speak. Uh, it's regrettable, it's disappointing, it's sad, uh, but I think um, that uh, despite all that, uh, we have to make the right decision, and uh, we can't sort of let a lot, whole life uh, sort of uh, go by us uh, so afraid, too afraid to to make those kinds of decisions. And I think the, that in the end is uh, sort of the, the, the issue that Stendhal doesn't talk about as much, but probably one of the most important ones, and, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get, gain some more clarity from, from some of the other writers we discuss in, in this series. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.